Welcome everybody to this final session of the UNCAD INET uh, Summer School. Um, the format of this final session is a little different from the previous lectures. It's a more, hopefully at least, a more interactive discussion that will pick up many of the themes that have been uh, discussed over the course of the last uh, four or five days. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll produce a lively and, and interactive discussion around where things are going and how things can go better. I think a lot of the discussion that we've had so far has, again, mapped out many of the inequities, imbalances, asymmetries that characterize the global economy as it's currently constituted. And I think there's a real feeling that we do need to do things very differently. The question is, can we? And if we can, how do we do things uh, differently to meet the various uh, challenges that the international community faces? We have five excellent speakers um, to, to discuss the issue of, um, is a new international economic order possible? Um, I'm going to introduce them uh, very briefly, and then I'm going to pose a question to each of them to get the conversation going. Uh, if you have any comments or questions, please put them into the chat. And at the end of our conversation, we'll pick up on some of the questions that, um, that you have. So without further ado, our, our five uh, panelists today are beginning with Jamie Martin, who is a assistant professor of history at Harvard University previously, I think, Jamie at Georgetown University before that. Uh, we have Kate uh, Aronoff, who is a staff writer at the New Republic and a journalist who has written extensively in The Guardian, Rolling Stone, The Nation, and other uh, outlets. We have Kevin Gallagher, who is a professor of global development policy at Boston University and director of the Global De Development Policy Center there in Boston. Uh, we have Vijay Prasad, who is director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social uh, Research and was formerly professor of international studies at Trinity College in Connecticut. And last but not least, we have Cecilia Nahon, who was formerly the Argentinian ambassador to the United States and is currently uh, the alternate executive director for the Southern Cone countries at the World Bank in Washington. Um, so that's the, that's the lineup. And I'm going to ask each of them a, a question around the work that they've been doing that speaks to this question of, of a new international order. And I think I'll start with Jamie, because he is the historian amongst uh, this panel. And I think it's always good to get to get the historical context right. Uh, Jamie has just published a book which I can recommend to everybody. Uh, it's a great book, The Meddlers, um, with the subtitle Sovereignty, Empire and the Origins of Global Economic Governance, um, which I think describes a very fine line, Jamie, between international economic governance and international economic interference. Um, as the institutions of governance unduly restrict the spot or tend to unduly restrict the policy space uh, of several uh, of sovereign uh, countries. And when and how aggressively uh, that line is crossed, I think reflects, at least in your interpretation, the hierarchy of power in an unequal world. And that was true of the origin, original uh, institutions that came out of the League of Nations, and you argue there's a real continuity between uh, those institutions and those that were forged at Bretton Woods at the end of the at the end of the Second World War. Um, and so, just to begin with, if you could just flesh out a little bit that continuity story, which is not what everybody sees in terms of a history of international governance. And, and you don't really talk in the book a lot about the new international economic order. I think it's referenced in passing, really. But maybe if you could just situate the NIEO in, in your schema of, of things. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me and thank you for that kind introduction, Richard. Um, so when I think about this question about the possibility of, of, you know, kind of creating a new international economic order, I must admit as a historian that I'm somewhat inclined to be wary um, of looking to the past for clear guidance on how to approach a problem like that. Certainly if this keeps us from thinking creatively and anew um, on our own. I do think the past is helpful, though, to see how deeply rooted the problems are. And as, as Richard mentioned in his opening remarks, my book, in many ways, is an attempt to see how um, kind of many of the problems about sovereignty, international cooperation, and coercion in the world economy today have quite deep roots, um, um, at the very least, in, in 19th century forms of empire. So one way that I talk about this in the book is I look at problems related to in international financial institutions like the IMF and the kind of quite um, um, unpopular powers they tend to wield today. So despite all that's happened over the last 25 years and all the bad press it gets, of course, the IMF continues to make the same demands on borrowers that it always has today. They enact, you know, they enact painful pro-cyclical policies if they want help, even though the IMF has kind of theoretically, at least some parts of it, uh, uh, demonstrated a new commitment to dealing with inequality, to a kind of cautious embrace of capital controls and these kind of her heretical um, ideas or supposedly heretical ideas. The IMF is still in many ways quite an old-fashioned um, institution. Now, generally, we often think of the powers, these kind of interventionist powers of the IMF as a product of the era of wa the Washington Consensus and neoliberalism. But what I, what I show in the book is that these powers did not originally emerge out of the blue in the late 20th century. Instead, this kind of unpopular and highly interventionist form of global governance has a much longer history, originally appearing at the end of the First World War, when powerful empires and private actors forged new partnerships in order to project power um, and protect their interests at a moment of enormous turmoil. So the birth of global economic governance after World War I involved a series of attempts to essentially reshape um, tools of empire for a new era, an era of rising self-determination, an era in which European empire was undergoing profound transformations, and an era of growing democratization in many states around the world. Um, so the first time that an international institution made bailout loans conditional on painful schemes of domestic austerity was not by the IMF in Latin America or Asia in the 1980s and 90s, but by the League of Nations and former Habsburg and Ottoman lands in Europe in the 1920s. And this involved adapting uh, techniques used by kind of uh, uh, semi-colonial debt commissions that had been set up before the First World War by European investors and governments in, in places um, like North Africa, the Balkans, Latin America, the Caribbean, and elsewhere. Um, and what I show in the book is that there were profound continuities and very deep continuities at the level of law, finance, institutions, between these pre-war tools of informal financial imperialism and the international institutions created after the First World War and then after the Second World War. And these continuities were obvious and glaring to contemporary observers. At the time, there was no kind of surprise if you were seeing these powers unfurl that they were rooted in these earlier imperial practices. Um, during an era of rising claims to self-determination, however, um, this made these powers you know, extremely um, unpopular and threatening. States, particularly new states or states with histories of foreign interference, didn't want to be bossed around and treated like poor semi-sovereign debtors of the 19th century, constantly under the watch of their creditors and not fully in control of their own domestic policies. So the point of these early international institutions, or one of the points, was essentially to make these interventions seem to be less humiliating by offering formal representation to states where these powers were to be deployed. In this way, these institutions were to make older imperial practices kind of seemingly more compatible for an era of rising self-determination and democratization. Now, moving along to the 1940s and after, um, this story continues to play out. So when the IMF was being designed in the 1940s, some of its architects insisted that the institution had to abandon these older imperial practices. It had to mark a kind of a new step in a departure from empire. Um, they didn't want an IMF that could bully states into slashing their budgets or abandoning post-war plans for welfareism, and they agreed that governments should be able to develop new powers to protect their citizens from the threat of economic crisis. And this is one of the reasons why Bretton Woods is often remembered fondly today, because in retrospect, some of its founders seem to believe in the need for the reconciliation of a moderate form of globalization with national welfareism, Keynesianism, and so on. 
Um, but what I show in the book is that actually there was very little real commitment to this vision among the most powerful US actors um, involved with the creation and early years of the IMF. And once the Second World War was over, um, the IMF began to act in ways that was kind of completely opposed um, to the visions of those who wanted a non-interventionist IMF. As soon as it began to make uh, loans to member states in the so-called developing world, it attached these same old demands um, for austerity to them. Already during the early Cold War, the IMF essentially began to act like these earlier um, imperial creditor arrangements, making these loans conditional on austerity and anti-inflationary policies, beginning in Latin American states like Bolivia, Paraguay, and Chile, and then more broadly. And it didn't take, I mean, the kind of one important takeaway message from this history is that it didn't take the rise of neoliberalism. It didn't take the kind of you know, dawn of the, the era of Reagan and Thatcher for these practices to reemerge. They were there from the beginning. Um, now the British were terrified um, during uh, the negotiations for Bretton Woods that this might happen in large part because they feared that a weakened and indebted British empire after the Second World War would face this uh, uh, IMF dominated by the US treasury um, and that it would you know, kind of work to prevent the creation of a national health service and the kind of beverage reforms. Um, and uh, almost as soon as the war was over, the British realized that they essentially lost this fight. Keynes had felt confident enough that he could kind of argue to uh, members of parliament that you know Britain would be safe from this interventionist IMF. But just before his death, Keynes himself realized that he'd actually lost the fight. Um, so the evolution of IMF conditionality begins very early, before the 1940s are over, and it accelerates in the 1950s and in the 1960s. And these powers were at first intended to be, in most cases, restricted in their fullest extent to states in the global south, um, where these powers entailed a kind of foreign interference that many recently independent states had already long faced in their economies, right? So as such, and kind of unsurprising, um, the demand for a robust kind of commitment to a right to non-interference or a kind of a recommitment to a right to non-interference became an important rallying cry among states in the global self well before the rise of the Washington Consensus, well before the kind of global neoliberal revolution. And this in fact was the first principle. If you look at the original principles of the movement for a new international economic order in the 1970s, this was the first one, right? So the movement for the NIO clearly recognized that there hadn't been any golden era of embedded liberal autonomy for most states after 1945, and that post-war neocolonialism was deeply rooted in older structures at the heart of the global economy. If you ask a powerful state in the North Atlantic after 1945, does embedded liberalism exist? They might say, sure, kind of, I guess. But if you ask other states, they would kind of laugh you out of the room, right? So what does this history mean today? Um, I think one point to emphasize is that we should be wary of imagining that the reform of global economic governance today um, should be thought of in terms of returning to a more humane era that supposedly existed in the mid 20th century before the rise of neoliberalism. Instead, I think to think more deeply about how re these reforms and the reforms we want need to overcome a much longer um, legacy um, of a kind of informal financial imperialism um, that continues to exist to this day. So I'll, I'll keep it at that. Great, a great way, great way to start, uh, Jamie. I'm, I'm going to turn, I think, to Kevin. There's a there's a funny scene in Annie Hall, right, where they're discussing something in a cinema queue about Marshall McEwen, and in in the movie. Woody Allen brings out Marshall McEwen to rebut the person in front of him who's annoying him about whatever it is they're discussing. I'm kind of going to do that in a funny way now because I'm going to ask Kevin and of course I, we wrote a, a book together about a new Bretton Woods so I'm going to retain my independent moderator hat but I'm going to ask Kevin maybe a little bit to push back on that because in a way what the what we argue is that there was this very profound moment in the late 30s and, and early 1940s when a, when a, a, a significant part of the uh, people thinking about reshaping the international order came out of the New, new Deal tradition, came, were, were international New Dealists, and, and, and they had a profound effect on, on the thinking about the, the, what kind of international order should come 
post Second World War, in which many of the things you meant they would, you know, they 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 resisted uh, financial bullying. They wanted developing countries to uh, in, in industrialize. They, uh, they wanted to advance an activist state agenda, which was the agenda that they themselves had shaped domestically for the for the previous decade. Um, and and in a sense. We argue that's still a relevant agenda when it comes to thinking about the new, the, a new international economic order, and it wasn't quite as um, absent, perhaps, from the post-war order as, as you you may uh, suggest, uh, Jamie. Maybe, Kevin, you could you could back me up on that and do your Marshall McLuhan kind of response to to Jamie's argument. Hey, well, first of all. Uh... Uh, thanks to Ined and Ungtad for for having us all together. Great to be here with with all these great folks, and and especially with with all of you young scholars. Uh, I've I've had the opportunity to to be part of this many times, and 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 fortunately many times in person. Sorry we can't be all there with you folks, but what a great uh, what a great lineup you've had for this whole whole week. You really can't get anything like this uh, anywhere else in the world. Uh, uh, especially at some of the universities that we all work with. So uh, I hope you all take uh, this whole week home with you and bring it back to your capital uh, and really start to think about making this part of the part of the work that you do. Um, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and also I want to shout out to Jamie's new book, which I'm almost halfway through. It's not only um, it's not only a, a, a well done piece of scholarship, but it's also well written, and so uh, it's not something that you have to read and slug through. It's something you can really run through. I couldn't agree more with uh, with Jamie about where we are right now. Uh, this is a critical turning point in the world economy, where the international economic order, where as my as my colleague Perry Merling, you spoke earlier, the IMF is a relatively smaller part of it. We've got the the Fed and the U.S. and the dollar really as the big driver. Uh, and the IMF, the, the multilateral development banks and other networks, and obviously the trading system is part of this larger international economic order, which unfortunately at this point in time has become inherently unstable financially, inherently unequal and environmentally unsustainable. And worse that the uh, the powers that are that constituted, especially the ones that sit at the head of table, are incapable and unwilling of challenging and taking on the challenges that we face with respect to financial instability, global inequality, and the climate disaster that we have. Uh, they're just, it's not willing, it's not fit for purpose to deal with that issue. As Jamie would say, parts of it uh, never were. Uh, and that uh, that is, that is the crisis of our time, this crisis of, uh, of multilateralism. We have a financial crisis somewhere every five to seven years. Uh, the, at, the, at the present moment, uh, we're obviously in a point with, that looks very much like the 1980s with rising interest rates and incredible amounts of debt distress at a time when we need to be mobilizing stepwise increases in finance to be able to create a more equal world and to address the climate crisis that we that we have in front of us. The world does seem a lot like the 1930s when we had the biggest crisis of multilateralism in the past hundred years, uh, when in London, uh, world nations were brought together to try to uh, stem a, a global depression and they absolutely failed and it turned into a worse depression and world war. Well, here we are just a, uh, about a decade after uh, uh, the biggest financial crisis of this century with incredible inequality and rising right-wing populism uh, and a climate uh, disaster that is, uh, that is having impacts on us every day here in Boston. We, uh, we had a 39.5 degree Celsius uh, day yesterday and uh, neighbors of mine walked their dog and watched people's lawns catch on fire just out of thin air. Uh, this is, uh, these, are the, these are the challenges of our time. What, uh, what I might quibble with, and I think most historians, especially economic historians would, is that it's not necessarily a straight line that got us here. I couldn't agree more that in the 20s and the 30s, uh, the world was very much exactly where we are right now, completely dominated by uh, footloose uh, and strong capital that largely had the countries, especially the Hoover administration, uh, basically echoing everything that, they, uh, everything that they were all about. Whereas when Roosevelt came to power, the coalition that he put together uh, was definitely a wedge in that system. 
and that the articles of agreement of the fund and the bank uh, and attempted uh, under the um, Havana Charter, under, under the trade agree, uh, trading system, uh, attempted to be a, um, a different way of, of global governance and, and multilateralism. And you can quibble over the different parts of that regime and the extent to which uh, and the timing and speed of which each one of these got us to the point where we are now. I, I, uh, I, would, I, would, uh, I would agree with Jamie that uh, we don't want to go back to that past, but I think what we want to go back to and what Richard and I call in our, in our moment that is undeniable of a, of a moment of realization that that wasn't working and is at least a set of principles, which at the time were about national sovereignty, full employment uh, and productive growth uh, because those were the challenges, both of the North and the Global South at the time, and that, that the, uh, there was an attempt to bake that into the system. Over time, let's, we could quibble about how quick and how deep and different parts of it uh, that that eroded away, but I think there's no question now that it's, compl that it's completely eroded. So we have to have that kind of a moment uh, where we redefine what the principles of the 21st century are. And yes, full and productive employment and quality jobs and, and living wages uh, are should be one of the core goals and core principles of a new system uh, with countries having the uh, sovereignty to be able to meet those goals at the appropriate ways for their countries. Different countries have different economic and political systems and different priorities and different levels of development. So that's going to take different, different, different approaches, different growth and development strategies in different countries. Uh, and countries need the policy space to be able to do that, but in a way that one country's attempt to meet their goals doesn't hurt another country's ability to do the same thing. And that's where multilateralism and global rules have to come in. And we also need a global financial safety net that realizes that inevitably some countries are gonna have crises no matter what they do, uh, especially with a climate change crisis that, uh, that, that there's nothing that humans can do about it at this point when there is a, another hurricane in Barbados and it impacts 200% of GDP, um, that is a financial crisis that cannot be, uh, can, can hardly be uh, anticipated and, and, uh, and is not a result of profligate, uh, uh, profligate left wing or right wing spending. Uh, it's, just, it's just mother nature. So these things are gonna happen anyway. And we do need a robust uh, global financial safety net, whether it be central banks, the International Monetary Fund, or these alternatives like the FLAR in, in Latin America, not only do they have to be able to provide liquidity finance, but they have to be able to do it so countries can have a counter cyclical response to these crises, not the austerity led ones that uh, Jamie's book is all about. But living wages, productive employment and catch up growth are only a piece of it for the 21st century. That was, a core, that was the core challenge, especially coming out of the depression for the 20th century. But now we also face growing national and international inequality and the climate crisis. And so countries need to be able to have policy space to have fundamental green structural transformation in their economies in a just and sustainable manner, which requires and gives economic and social impetus to a level of transformation that, ha that uh, has never been seen in, in, the, in the world before. Uh, I'll, end, I'll end here, but uh, not only uh, did the system allow the, the North and the United States to be able to, to expand in a way that it wanted to, but obviously some of the most profound levels of structural transformation uh, in the world economy happened through countries that weren't uh, in, in the developing world that capitalized on that uh, policy space in between the 1950s uh, up, in, up until the 1980s and in the China case uh, up, in, up until about 2001 when it joined the WTO. These countries really uh, had profound structural transformations in their economies that, uh, that are really the lifeblood of what, what holds, holds the, the, the most developed economies, developed economies among the developing world uh, at the forefront right now. I'll, uh, I'll just leave those as my opening remarks, but happy to have conversations about this throughout. Thanks. Richard. Thanks, Kevin. It's, uh, look, it's a great segue. I think I'll turn to Kate, really, because given that you ended on, on what is, it's not an altogether new challenge. I mean, 50 years ago, after all, Kate was the limits to growth, the Stockholm Conference. It wasn't that the environmental issues were completely absent from and earlier discussions of global governance, but clearly the climate challenge has 
turbocharge that, that, that those concerns uh, in a way. And and I guess I guess like many of us, your work in a way picked up from the kind of Green New Deal narrative that began to, well, has its origins in a way in the UK in the time of the global financial crisis, but was really picked up in the US um, from the middle of the of the last the last decade. Let me let me read so, uh, let me read a quote from something you wrote from uh, the the book, which is also highly recommended, The Planet to Win, that you co-authored with with colleagues, uh, where you say, for a Green New Deal to confront the planetary dimension of climate change, it needs to be internationalist in scope, forging new solidarities and partnerships with social movements and governments around the world. That will involve diplomacy between states and renegotiation of trade rules, as well as international coordination by social movements to force governments and companies to comply with democratic values. Um, interesting just to get your take on the, uh, the links between a, a global Green New Deal, which we, we've also talked about, and a new new international economic order. Are these the, essentially the same things or uh, is there something different there? But more importantly, whether you think, you know, Western governments, particularly your own government, are ready to do the right thing as you frame it in terms of an international agenda. It's something you follow very closely, you write extensively about, particularly the, the, the actions of the US government vis-a-vis -vis, uh, climate policy. So, so uh, you know, is it, is the Western, are Western governments really in a position to kind of pursue this kind of agenda? Yeah, thank you. Uh, this, this panel is sort of a short list of the people I read and talk to whenever I have questions about <laughs> this part of, uh, this part of the climate world. So uh, it's, it's a real honor to, to be here. Uh, and my, my entry into thinking about some of these questions is really an odd one, which is through reporting on the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Process, which is a very strange world um, to inhabit. And I had been going for a couple of years uh, before I actually read some of the the literature around the NIEO, including by people who are who are on this panel. Uh, and it made a lot of things click that really had not been clear to me for a long time. And, you know, trying to understand what is happening in this very sort of legalese filled uh, negotiations. And that's the, the basic sort of power dynamic um, is very similar, right, to, you know, what you might think about 30, 40, 50 years ago, uh, in that the sort of habit of these sorts of meetings, whether that's Paris or Glasgow, uh, the ones in between is that you have uh, a pretty stark divide, right, between uh, the global north and the global south. And those are complicated, big uh, categories that we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't overly simplify, but it is striking how simple some of those debates um, can be in, in the United Nations climate change process in that you will have almost reliably the United States, uh, sometimes in league with Europe, um, really holding very stark red lines around particularly issues of climate finance, uh, and even some of these sort of definitional terms, right? The big uh, point that the United States has been making for almost as long as these talks have happened is around this language of common but differentiated responsibility, right? Which is baked into uh, the UNFCCC. And at every turn, the United States has tried to obscure what that actually means. So what does common but differentiated responsibility mean? Uh, it is an acknowledgement of the fact that the United States is the world's largest historical emitter of greenhouse gases and that wealthy nations have been responsible for the vast majority of this crisis and have paid very little into uh, finding a truly global solution, right? Of, you know, OECD numbers released just this week show a $17 billion gap in the $100 billion pledge that rich nations made many years ago um, for climate finance. Uh, and that has been the sort of red line that rich nations have held. And you reliably see social movements, civil society groups, trade unions at these talks, um, pushing for much more, right? Pushing for um, something that mirrors an equitable world order, uh, which had been uh, defeated, right? When these talks started happening in around 1992 
when I was born, basically. Uh, and so when we have this uh, sort of global conversation about climate change starting uh, in, in 1992, around, you know, a, a few years before then as well, you have these two things happening, right? You have the sort of hegemony of, of neoliberal economics, it's, you know, the uh, sort of triumph of free market uh, and uh, a very sort of, uh, a, a very unequal world order, which, you know, that had been contested at various points, uh, but you really do have the United States and rich nations commanding uh, that presence. And if you want the sort of physical uh, picture of how that happens, I remember in Glasgow uh, just this past year, in the final, final hours of the negotiations going to overtime, you had the scrum forming around John Kerry around the U.S. International Climate Envoy, um, basically asking, you know, will they cede ground on questions of climate finance, on questions of loss and damage? Uh, and that is a veto power that has not uh, changed. And it's why I find uh, the sort of thinking that you all have done around a new Bretton Woods, around a more equitable world order, learning lessons from the new international economic order uh, as really uh, instructive and I think really a Essential as we wrote in a planet to win to sort of thinking through what an actually global solution to this crisis looks like uh, and you know the folks on this panel um, and elsewhere have have been talking about a global green new deal right an internationalist green new deal as we talk about um, as an anecdote to what even on sort of the progressive end of the climate spectrum in the United States can be very parochial uh, borderline protectionist thinking right about what it looks like to take on this crisis. So you can have a very classic sort of green Keynesianism articulation uh, of a Green New Deal, which says we are going to rebuild our manufacturing base in the United States uh, to churn out EVs and wind turbines and uh, solar panels. And that will be how we uh, how we you know tackle this crisis and just sort of sub out right the uh, material basis of, of fossil fuel capitalism with uh, green capitalism, right? Uh, and that uh, is is really uh, insufficient, right? Because we know that the supply chains for these uh, these things are not, you know, held within one country, right? That if you are building an EV, you need inputs from uh, the salt mine from Chile, you need lithium from all over the world, you need uh, copper from all over the world, you need uh, elements that uh, are really spanning, uh, spanning the globe, and that that can be as we write in a planet to win a sort of um, uh, opportunity for solidarity, right to think through well, what are the inputs of an energy transition and how can they um, be a place to think through what do uh, people, what are people demanding in Serbia, for instance, around lithium mines or in Chile around lithium mines and what are workers in EV factories in uh, Brandenburg or Michigan uh, demanding and what is their common interest, not what is the common interest of these sort of bureaucrats who gather every year uh, in global capitals to think through um, what it might look like to take on this crisis. And so, um, yeah, and I, I think, you know, in, in trying to uh, reckon with these questions of the materiality of the energy transition, of the cooperation uh, challenge, of challenges of global debt, uh, really the sort of um, the lessons of the NIEO and the sort of history that you all have provided, I think is essential really to just uh, giving ourselves a basic framework to understand the power dynamics involved in, uh, in climate politics today, um, and also to create a sort of map forward to what, uh, what the future can, can look like. Great, thanks, thanks Kate. And, uh... And that kind of thing maybe leads us to VJ. I mean, you've written extensively a history of the, the rise and the fall of the new international economic order. And that, of course, includes the forces that were opposed to it uh, vehemently from the beginning, but also its links to internal pressures in support of a new international economic, economic order and ultimately against it with, from within the developing world itself. You, you're right, I think at one place in, in I can't remember which book, did you, you, you know better than I do, you refer to the South not as a place, but a project. It's not a, it's not a geographical concept as such, even though we think of it in those terms. It's very much a political concept and, and clearly 
the strength of the of the new of the original order was a backbone within the south both political and intellectual which couldn't uh, survive the various uh, internal and external pressures that were lined against that i wonder you know in light of that history where we are today or where you think we are today in terms of an organized south that could backstop the kinds of progressive agenda uh, to address the various crises where do we stand with that with that project in the 21st century well richard first it's a pleasure to be uh, at the, an untad school uh, i've had a long um, association with untad including 10 years ago i think i was the only reporter at the doha untad 13 where i watched with amazement as the swiss representative held up the proceedings by doing line edits that might have taken at least a year to have completed uh, so that UNCTAD couldn't actually be um, fulfilled in UNCTAD 13. I don't know if you have a memory of that from Doha, but uh, it actually leads us to recall something important, which is there are subjects in history. You know, we, we, we talk a lot about we need to do this or this needs to happen in passive voice. Uh, who is the we? Is there a we in, in the world? And um, do things just happen or does somebody have to make them happen? I think these are, for me, compelling questions because we know, we, that is, um, those of us here know um, that these attempts, particularly from formerly colonized countries, these attempts to reshape the international order were consistently blocked. I mean, let's be quite fair. UNCTAD itself is a creature of the non-aligned movement, which itself is a creature of the anti-colonial movement. I mean, you know, I know, and Cecilia will know much better than I, but um, Raoul Prebich was not a radical, but Raoul Prebich was certainly a product of a civilization of people who wanted a dignity in the world, sovereignty in the world, uh, Prebich's leadership at UNCTAD from 1964 uh, was basically along those grain, along that grain, to try to, um, you know, change the way decisions were made, not just what the decisions should be. You know, it's not just a question of policy space; it's a question of who gets to make the decisions, and is there going to be democratization of the world order? That was the mandate of UNCTAD. It wasn't just, it wasn't merely. Let's find a good policy on this or that. Who gets to make the decisions? We'll remember that the W, the International Trade Organization meeting in Havana in 1948 collapsed on uh, in terms not of what should be the world order, but who gets to decide. It was always a question of whose hand is on the lever. And I think that's significant. I'd like to put that on the table. I'm speaking to you from Santiago, Chile. Next year will be the 50th anniversary of the coup d'etat against Salvador Allende's government. Um, that was significant. Why was there a coup? You know, uh, the coup took place for myriad reasons. One of them being that in 1972, the year before, uh, Allende's government nationalized copper. Now, I'm not saying nationalization is a good thing or a bad thing, but the fact is that this certainly irked the United States government. And we know now that there's no dispute here that the U.S. government green-lighted the coup against Salvador Allende. Augusto Pinochet uh, was sent out of the barracks to overthrow the government. Nixon and Kissinger um, had, in all those tapes, made it very clear that they were the ones who uh, pushed the button for this. Well, why? And what's significant about 1973? Hello. We're talking about the new international economic order. In 1973, just before the coup, the NAM met, the heads of governments met in Algeria. I visited that beautiful uh, conference center in Algiers where NAM met in 1973. At that meeting, Indira Gandhi stands up and says, something is happening to our brother Salvador Allende in Chile. Um, what were they discussing at that NAM meeting? You know, uh, what was on the table? It was the new international economic order. And I would like to suggest that in a sense, the coup d'etat against Salvador Allende and the junking of the NIEO are related. In other words, I'm putting on the table the fact 
that there is no we in the world. Uh, certain countries, the United States in the lead, as Kate has said, in terms of um, climate, but in the lead, even in terms of who gets to make decisions in, 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 uh, you know, in terms of trade and development and so on. The United States intervened forcefully in the 1970s against Chile, certainly, that was a narrow um, you know, intervention because it was against one country. But you know, I've written about this in the poorer nations. There's documented evidence of what Daniel Patrick Moynihan was doing at the United Nations and how they were able to scuttle the NIEO by essentially not just scuttling the NIEO, they actually sank the boat, but by scuttling the UN General Assembly and moving decision-making entirely to the Security Council. That was a plan, that was an agenda. Um, it was to actually undermine the attempt at building global democracy. Let's not be naive about it. It's not like from 1945 till you know, 1980s, there was some sort of democracy in the world and, and there was a kind of global Keynesianism which equally um, you know, benefited everybody. Nobody's saying that, we are not naive about this, but there was certainly a struggle UNCTAD's formation in 64, part of that struggle. The attempt to pass the NIE on 1973-74, part of that struggle. Um, but they constantly were interrupted and defeated. The straight line between the undermining of the NIEO in 1974 and the Doha conference of UNCTAD in 2012 um, couldn't, for me, be clearer. Uh, it's a straight line. The Swiss ambassador essentially said, UNCTAD has no business operating. Um, everything should take place perhaps at the OECD um, or at the, at the World Trade Organization, but not at UNCTAD because here the South has too much um, decision-making power. That was a direct quote. I remember talking to Heiner Flashback and the margins of, of, of UNCTAD 13, which I think is a very significant event um, because it really brought many of these issues right to the front of the discussion. Okay. Now, in this recent period, um, and I don't want to get too deeply into this now, but we have gone from the NIEO to the Sustainable Development Goals. When the SDGs were first put on the table, and by the way, what a strange number, 17 SDGs. I mean, for God's sake, couldn't it have been 20 or 15? But anyway, 17. When the SDGs were put on the table, I was very critical of this, saying that, look, this is sort of welfareism. This is not changing the structure of decision making. This is not changing the politics. This is mere welfareism. Today, I'll champion welfareism till I'm blue in the face because the situation in the world is so poor for most people, hunger rates at historical highs and so on. Nonetheless, and don't uh, look to me for the number, but this is the... Um, this is, you know, people uh, from the banks and so on who say there's a hundred trillion dollar shortfall in funding for the SDGs, hundred trillion, perhaps between two and four trillion a year uh, shortfall. Most people are saying, by the way, that the SDGs are finished. Okay, so that's it's now just like window dressing. Um, I I feel bad for Secretary General Gutierrez who has to come before the cameras consistently at each UN day for hunger, day for this, day for that, and plead for SDG financing. But from where? Where is this going to come? It's not going to come from, um, you know, from the 37 plus trillion dollars that are sitting in illicit tax havens. It's not going to come from there, although it should. We call, Look, the international community calls those tax havens illicit. It's not my word. They call them illicit. Isn't it about time people made some moves to draw some of that financing for the social good rather than allow it to sit in an island somewhere, um, you know, untouched by human hand, uh, as we say in India? Here's my final point on this. You know, here's my final point, friends. I mean, I feel upset by the world order, distressed even by the situation in the world. And you should too. Um, you who are young intellectuals and so on should not look at this too clinically. Uh, things are miserable for lots of people around the world. We need to develop a heart when we think about trade and development in economics. You know, gone are the days when you can be a sort of clinical surgeon. And let me tell you something. Surgeons feel a lot when they uh, operate on somebody. Economists need to feel. I feel that generations of economists have told don't feel about anything. 
Um, we brought together at Tricontinental 26 research institutes, and we created a text together. Uh, these are institutes from Lebanon, from Argentina, from Cuba, from South Africa, from India, and so on. And we created a little text called A Plan to Save the Planet. Um, you can get this at our website at Tricontinental. It's a silly little plan, okay? It's our attempt, 26 research institutes, to say, this is how, what we want in the world. We want to make a claim on the world. I'm afraid today, with the kind of tension mounting between the United States and China, tensions around Eurasia, there is no governmental um, confidence. Uh, governments of the South simply don't have the confidence to stand up at the next NAM meeting and say, you know what, we need a new NIEO. Uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, and with these kind of tensions mounting, this impending war between the United States and China, um, I very much doubt that cooperation is on the agenda. We need cooperation. We don't need conflict. We certainly need cooperation. I thought Dr. Tedros at the start of the pandemic said it very well, you know, when he said that we don't need to pit people against each other. You know, he was reflecting on the kind of anti-China rhetoric that was developing then. We need to bring people together. We don't need a clash of civilizations, as Samuel Huntington put it. But let's actually take a leaf out of the book of the Iranian leadership who responded by saying, let's have a dialogue between civilizations. We really need to push for that. And you need to push for that, not because it's necessarily intellectually the right thing, but also because it's for humanity. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Vijay, great. Of course, before the coup in 73, um, Chile hosted the third UNCTAD conference in 19, 50 years ago, 1972, which I think many people see as the first conference where the idea of a new international economic order was, was actually kind of raised. It, it was, that was the language that began to ferment in, in Santiago. So, so there's a kind of 50 years since that process uh, began, to take, began to take shape in which we have a, a vested interest of, of a kind. Uh, you know, the financing issue, of course, is uh, any, any talk of a new international economic order and the SDGs, and the SDGs, is a, if, it, if it's anything, it's a massive investment push. I mean, it cannot, it cannot deliver without a huge uh, uh, mobilization and, and redirection of financial resources. Um, and as you rightly said, that is, there are very big questions to be asked about whether we have a financial system that can actually deliver on the kind of investments implied by the Sustainable Development Goals, and of, which takes us, of course, now to Cecilia Nahon, I think appropriately, because you are operating on a daily basis in the, in the belly of the international financial order, I guess, of sorts. And, and we have heard recent calls from inside that there's something systemically wrong. Georgieva has made noises to that effect. Janet Yellen, in a recent speech, made noises uh, 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 to that effect as, as well. Um, and so I guess, you know, I guess it, the question is where, whether you think the kind of systemic reforms that are required uh, to be able to deliver uh, a, 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 the kind of financing needed to build inclusive and sustainable pathways is, is realistic. And if it is realistic, where, where are the kind of key moves that we need to see change if we're going to build a more effective uh, international financial order to support the kind of goals that we all agree are necessary? Okay, thank you very much, Richard. Thank you to INET and to UNCTAD for the invitation. I want to first uh, commend basically the students, the participants in, in this uh, program. I think uh, the world needs uh, new thinking, but also new collective thinking and action. And this type of uh, experiences, at least for me, when I was a young scholar in Argentina, the extracurricular education, the debates, uh, the reading outside, of the main uh, class lists uh, has always been the most useful, the most empowering, uh, and honestly, the most uh, fascinating. So uh, I'm really happy that you have this opportunity and hope you really take advantage of it. So on your question, Richard, which 
very much relates with what we have been discussing. Um, I think that yes, uh, as you've mentioned, uh, since the pandemic, there has been repetitive calls for big reforms made by the civil society, made by the academics, made by some leaders, uh, also you know, high level leaders at the IMF, at the treasury, on the need to reshape and reform and transform the multilateral system. Uh, I've been calling for that. We have all been calling for this well before the pandemic. In fact, we, we really think, I really think that we need to, to have a, a systemic relevant bold reform of the multilateral financial trade and investment system. Uh, but also I think we need to be very realistic as you also mentioned, and very candid and honest when we assess where we are now and what's really going on. Uh, the truth is that uh, despite the calls, despite the hopes, despite the promises, the international system has not and is not fully building back better. I think that we've seen some progress in some areas, and I mean, I will mention to that, but it seems that the Bretton Woods momentum, right, has been lost on, on in many ways it is lost. Uh, also, I need to say, reform is not good by itself. As we've learned just from the history, reforms can be progressive, but they can also be regressive. So the issue that we should always focus on is what is the content of these reforms? Who are driving these reforms? What interests are representing these reforms? So we need substantive change, but the truth is that this change has proven much harder than many have expected and have hoped for. In fact, um, for geopolitical reasons, because of the big disputes that we're seeing at the global level right now, there's in fact not even a reform momentum to deal with uh, big issues, but there's in many ways some paralysis, some deadlock to deal with small issues as well. So I think that we developing countries need to really have a good assessment of this moment and have a very concrete agenda, a very focused agenda of priorities, of key issues that are of life of death to all of us. Because the truth is that urgencies of developing countries are mountains. We're going through crisis, over crisis, overlapping crisis, you know them, that climate, poverty is rising, inequalities are deepening all throughout the global south, financial instability, um, income distribution is getting even more uh, despair. So I think that we need to really focus on, on a concrete agenda uh, of proposals that have and can have a specific and concrete impact on the lives of many people around the world. Uh, you know, there's an African proverb that says, when elephants fight, it is the grass that suffers. Well, we need to join forces and make sure that the grass doesn't suffer, that we can stop that. And I think that that really needs concrete specific reforms. Uh, of course, the development world is very diverse. It's very heterogeneous, you know? We have diversity in terms of political positions, geographical situations, productively, we're significantly diverse in terms of our cultures, in terms of, it's not that easy sometimes to coordinate agendas as it is, for example, for G7 or European countries that are much more homogeneous in, in, in so many ways. Uh, but we need to do that. And I think that we are seeing some action in this uh, sense. And I would like to, to focus now just to say the titles of what I think has to be the, the main buckets of action. Uh, to move forward in an agenda that can be implemented and can be successful. Honestly, the most transformative now, the most ambitious agenda now, I think is to focus on specific uh, issues and really join forces, academics, political leaders, policy uh, people on uh, backing up that agenda. And I think there are two buckets basically uh, that I would like to focus on. First, as Richard just mentioned, financing. And second, key policy reforms in some areas. Financing, there's absolutely an urgency and a need to scale up development finance. You know, uh, fiscal space is shrinking. We need to do counter-cyclical policies, as Jamie mentioned at the beginning. The gap in annual funding to achieve the SDGs goes over two, three trillion. And now the multilateral system is delivering on the billions. It is good, right? I mean, if you take the World Bank, what I represent, uh, Argentina and the Southern Cone, the World Bank Group has expanded 
its financing for developing countries in the last three years since the pandemic, 57% from pre-pandemic levels. It's good, it's welcome, it's necessary, it's clearly not enough. So what can we do? I think there are very concrete things. Uh, first, it's urgently to capitalize the multilateral development banks. Um, you know that the MDBs have a very successful and effective and efficient, I will say, financial model. You know, the MDBs, if you take the World Bank, for example, 20.5 billion of dollars have been accumulated as paid in capital by all the countries around the world, mostly large countries, but all of us have in fact contributed. From these 20.5 billion in paid in capital over the last 70 something years, the World Bank has been able to provide funding for loans uh, to developing countries for around 800 million, 800 billion, sorry. So this basically means that you multiply by a lot the level of financing. Of course, we need to make sure that this financing is geared to good investment projects, good development projects, not to finance capital flight, not to finance an unequal uh, income distribution, not to finance uh, speculation, right? So we need to make sure that the usage of these funds and of these development loans is really focused on development and the poor. That's a big discussion, but certainly what we also need is more financing and focused on, on developing countries as well. The, the G7, for example, some countries are talking that we need to maximize the balance sheet of uh, the multilateral development banks. There's a research done by the G20 and some others on how we can maximize this. I agree with that, but we also need to scale up the financing. Some countries are also asking for prep, so for something that is uh, presented as kind of the new, uh, the new uh, bullet, you know, kind of the new promise, uh, the new illusion, the, the silver bullet of uh, development finance, which is private capital mobilization. Maybe you've heard about this. There's a significant uh, underscoring by some countries of the need of the private sector to jump in and kind of deliver for the SDGs and uh, finance the climate transitions. Again, I am of the view of all of the above. Of course, we need to uh, promote private sector financing. Uh, it's important, it's necessary, but I think we don't have to be over-optimistic about this or realist irrealistic about this. There's never been a development uh, led by the private sector. It has been always been the public sector, the sovereign sector, and partnership with the MGBs that can do this. So what we need, and I will finish with this comment on, on the issue of financing, what we really need is new thinking on how the private sector, the public sector, and the MDBs can effectively partner together and mobilize more resources. You know, we won't be able to outsource SDGs to the private sector. That's, I don't think it's realistic, but we need to leverage and build on private sector financing to focus on, on development led by planning and led by identification of opportunities by, by the government, avoiding the privatization of gains, you know, and uh, the losses being transferred to, to the public sectors. We also need a big push on SDRs, you know, I think that there's more that can be done on SDRs, uh, special drawing rights of the IMF. We also need to remove some very regressive policies that the IMF still has in place, like the surcharges policies, uh, around 16 countries around the world are paying an additional interest rate to the IMF when we most need the resources. Uh, Kevin has written a lot about this and I think there's very concrete you know, agenda. And then of course we need the second bucket is key policy reforms. We can discuss that further, but there's a, a few priorities there. We need a reform of the sovereign debt architecture. Clearly 60% of low income countries 30% of developing countries are under debt stress or even very close to, to crisis, to default. Sri Lanka could be one of many countries. And again, a reverse, a, cri a debt crisis can be a reversal in development gains of decades. 
of decades. So I think the urgency of the moment calls us to focus again on sovereign debt ideas. What well, the World Bank and the IMF are doing is clearly not enough, you know, have been insufficient. The DSSI, the common framework, you know, there's these initiatives, which again are welcome and necessary, but just not delivering the level of relief the level of debt support that the world needs. And of course, the last issue was mentioned, uh, of course, also by BJ, international tax cooperation. Due to the lack of fiscal space, uh, we need to give more centrality on this, and we need to get together as developing countries on a very concrete agenda on how we can leverage uh, and better on that. Latin America loses 6% of our GDP due to evasion, illusion and profit shifting. This is an area in which uh, work has to be truly, truly pushed. So basically I'm, I'm asking and, and trying to promote where I sit at the World Bank for a common perspective on these issues, also on development, on climate, uh, that can lead to a specific concrete agenda of proposals that we can agree on, that we can push on, and in which the knowledge, the expertise, uh, the research by all the, these amazing researchers and, and thinkers around the table, I think it's absolutely valuable and essential uh, to do innovative thinking and to help us push for an agenda that can in fact, in fact transform the lives of millions and millions of people in the South that are going through a very, very hard time. Thank you very much. Great, Cecilia, thank you very much. Well, I want to pick up on some questions that there's a lot of questions and I can't go through them. I want to try and just um, put a number of them together and then pose them to you. In, I think I'll, in a way, maybe picking up from what you said, you carefully avoided the question, which has come up in, in a number of questions, about whether the Washington institutions have themselves changed sufficiently to be able to do the things that you rightly pointed out are needed to be done. I mean, to, to give you an example, of when I was there in April and had the pleasure of meeting a senior IMF official to discuss some of these issues, on the debt question, I, there was no real sense that we were in the kind of crisis that you, you just outlined that needed some systemic reforms. Basically, what we had in place already should be enough, given that only a handful of countries have actually gone into default in the course of the uh, COVID pandemic and, and, and recent months. So, so, so maybe I'll ask Jamie and Kevin. You, Jamie, you're an outsider. You look at the history of that. I guess you, in the process of looking at the history, you have to look at what they're doing now. What would, I mean, do you think, do you see changes in the Washington-based institutions that would suggest that they could uh, inspire a kind of systemic reform agenda of the kind that we're talking about? There's certainly changes in what people speak about. There's a change in emphasis. There's certainly, you know, much more chatter about inequality there's been this kind of limited embrace of some, as I mentioned, kind of formally heretical ideas like capital controls in certain limited circumstances. But I think as various scholars and, and activists have pointed out, you know, some of this is window dressing. Some of this is an attempt to kind of re-legitimate an institution like the IMF that has suffered from a kind of profound unpopularity, um, certainly since the late 1990s. And that if you actually look at what the IMF is doing, it still kind of continues to make um, these pro-cyclical demands, the kind of price of doing business with it. I mean, Oxfam recently um, did this quite telling report that showed the vast majority of emergency loans made during the COVID pandemic came with the same kind of old fashioned demands for fiscal restraint on borrowers. I mean, at a moment of a global pandemic, this seems, you know, um, you know, kind of profoundly unsuited to the challenges um, these states were facing. And so, you know, one thing that I think my history leads me to believe is that we shouldn't necessarily be surprised at this, right? If you think of this not in terms of just a 20 or 25 or 30 year history, but actually, you know, about a century of history, it makes sense that the IMF as an institution still operates in this extremely old fashioned and hidebound fashion, hidebound way. Right, that it's not just a product of relatively recent changes in economics or kind of policy approaches, but it's a very, very old way of, of dealing with debtors that it continues um, uh, to kind of operate according to. 
Kevin, should we be yeah, optimistic? All of these presentations, great. Uh, we have no choice but to but to but to be optimistic, especially with uh, all of the all of our friends in the in the audience. Uh, for our future depends on it. Um, one thing that that really should be said, especially for our for our audience here, is that we fundamentally need these kinds of institutions to have sustainable, equal, and environmentally sustainable growth uh, uh, over time. Charles Kindleberger pointed out that there's sort of five core public goods that need to be provided in the world economy in order for it to work well, because we're all integrated now. Uh, you need a lender of last resort. You need uh, stable exchange rates and stable financial markets. You need a counter cyclical lending because the private sector inherently does not think about the long run. You need a stable uh, trading system that doesn't allow uh, beggar neighbors. And you need coordination among nations. So that if uh, if some countries really want to expand, but other countries are into austerity, that the two that the that the world doesn't go in in, in opposite directions and hurt everybody's uh, hurt everybody's goals. So th those are fundamental. And now in the 21st century, you have to say that we need a stable climate for us to be able to have the prosperous and prosperity that we need uh, to to enhance the world. So these institutions are needed. Um, and the question is, can they be reformed or should they be replaced? I would say that the, 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 the absolute worst period was the 1990s. And if we want to use, uh, in terms of these living institutions, I think Jamie's right that before these, this set of institutions were around, things were much worse than the 20s and 30s. But in terms of the, the post, uh, post Bretton Woods era, the absolute time, worst time was the 1990s. If you use that as a baseline, uh, these institutions at varying levels are, are better. I would agree with Cecilia of, of the three sort of pillars of the regime, the sort of financial regime, the development banking regime, and the trading regime is that the development banking re regime has undergone the, the most reform. Uh, no longer does the World Bank do the kinds of conditionality uh, that it did in the 1990s. In the 1990s, the World Bank and the IMF worked in lockstep to provide any financing that was provided uh, had to be on condition of deregulating your financial markets, privatizing state-owned enterprises. And as Cecilia will tell you at the board of directors, they're not doing that anymore. Uh, they're not, uh, they're not uh, back to their heyday, which when they were financing uh, national development banks and financing industrial policy in developing countries. They're not doing that, uh, um, but, they're, but, they're, but they're not as bad as they were in the 1990s. I think Jamie's largely right on the IMF. Uh, they have, um, they've made some steps, um, but a lot of it is usually at, uh, thinking at the top. Uh, we've just published a study on IMF austerity uh, here at the Global Development Policy Center, and unfortunately we've shown that uh, the austerity policies, despite the change in rhetoric, have largely stayed the same uh, throughout uh, throughout the past 30 years, with the one exception of the year 2020, uh, where the majority of IMF programs did allow some uh, did allow some leeway. And of course, Cecilia's country worked really hard uh, on the recent deal between Argentina and the, and uh, uh, and the IMF that. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure all of us would, would be concerned with it in, in general, but it, it is a larger opening than almost any other program in its history. Um, where, do we, where do I get the hope? The, the bumps in some of these institutions have happened in this century, largely because there's alternatives. We live in a much different world now, developing countries especially have a much different world than they had in the 1990s and 1980s, when the only source of foreign capital were the Washington-based institutions, right? Now, for better or worse, you have private capital markets, but you have China development banks, you have the Brazilian National Development Bank, you have these BRICS banks. There's all different sources of uh, uh, all different sources of financing that you can get out there, uh, which all some of you know they're not they're not uh, romantically perfect things by any stretch of the imagination. Our center does a lot of research on these things, but it gives developing countries more choice and agency that allow them to bid and compete with respect to the international institutions. And there's, there's uh, lots of books written about this. There's a great book called uh, Raise the Debt, uh, how Ch countries choose their creditors and shows that the arrival of China in, in particular allows countries to get better deals from the World Bank and, and to avoid going to the IMF so that they don't have to have the policies that, uh, 
that Jamie uh, that Jamie talks about. So in, to me, an agenda globally is to have more coordination about these alternative institutions. Delink the Chiang Mai Initiative from the IMF. Delink the Contingent Reserve Arrangement from the IMF and start using it. Uh, when you're in negotiations with the World Bank uh, and the IMF, make sure you also are with the China Development Bank. And so, so you can try to get uh, better deals through, through these things. And that the only way Washington will change is if there's pressure and the pressure from the within has not worked so well because by definition, the large shareholders uh, make all the decisions and have veto power. So the change has to come from without uh, civil society organizations, but, uh, but perhaps more importantly, through the finance ministries, the central banks of the emerging market and developing economies in these alternative arrangements. The United States is now a major embracer of industrial policy on both in both parties, led more by the Republican Party than the left, uh, uh, the left, not because of new economic thinking, with all due respect to INET, because of China, because there's an alternative out there that is, that is growing and having more influence around the world. These alternatives need to be leveraged in the institutions to get changed in the institutions, and they need to be hedged. And if these institutions can't, uh, can't deliver, then, uh, then maybe we need to create other ones. I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, that we can that, that there can this leveraging game being going on. I wrote a book called I'll stop here called Ruling Capital that shows how this sort of small bump that Jamie talks about in the change in the IMF's thinking uh, with respect to capital controls uh, was all about that kind of political economic dynamic, uh, developing countries grouping together uh, to put pressure within the IMF, but also using alternative institutions and their alternative ability to uh, buttress and self-insure themselves as a leverage to say, look, if you don't give us these changes, then we're basically just going to do this on our own with, a, with an alternative set of tools and institutions. And that's what you need, sort of an inside outside game. And uh, there was real momentum about that uh, on that level uh, right after the global financial crisis. But unfortunately, because of many of the regime changes, this larger global move to the right that uh, that and and VJ has written about this. Not that the BRICS coalition was perfect on any on any uh, on any level, but um, but there was a general alignment on some of these things, which is now frayed. Um, there is there's not really a core coalition of uh, especially large countries that can lead the way that have enough market power to uh, to be able to stand up. Uh, really. Um, with all due respect, the Brazilians and the, the, the Indians are, are just, uh, and obviously Russia are just not the, uh, the area for uh, what we call um, uh, I think I lost my, what, can, you, can folks still hear me? I've been going on too yeah. long. There's yeah. other people. Um, Kevin, okay, mean, that's, it's a good, it's, I mean, it speaks to a lot of questions actually in the chat and I'm, I'll bring VJ back in here about, and it's a fine line, whether we're moving towards a multipolar world or a fragmented world. I, th I think there are very different implications if you frame the direction of travel in one way or the other. Um, now, the center of that, I think, is, uh, is as Kevin suggests, is, is the rise of China. Uh, and that was not part of the original new... In China was not really a big player, of course, in the original new international economic order. It, it was not. I mean, it only entered the United Nations system, I think, in 1972 anyway. Um, so China... I, I wonder what your take is on the China story, uh, VJ. What opportunities, what challenges that might pose? And whether, and whether we are in a multipolar we're well, moving towards a multipolar world, which sounds like a good thing, or we're fragmenting, which sounds like it's going to pose a lot of, a lot of big challenges for, the, for, for meeting global goals. It's an excellent way to frame um, this part of the discussion, Richard. You, you remember that there was a long period when we would go to these meetings and it would be the G77 plus C because China actually would just join the G77 on various initiatives, but only from outside, wouldn't come in. It was in fact in the Cancun meetings 
um, around the question of uh, subsidies uh, on agriculture in the north that we saw China get involved quite, um, you know, um, actually quite forcefully. Uh, we forget that the BRICS starts as IBSA at Cancun, India, Brazil, South Africa, again over pharmaceuticals and over agricultural subsidies. China has taken time to enter into a more, let's say, direct um, uh, position where it actually tries to say, no, we have certain opinions. Um, that's what I was talking about earlier in terms of a political project. China suspended its kind of internationalism for a very long period and has now come back uh, into the field. So I'd, I'd like to make three points about that. The first is actually it's quite an ugly situation because part of this demonization of China um, is taking place just when China has come into uh, offering choices to countries over development financing. So you, you know that the People's um, Bank has come out with this currency swap window, um, which actually Argentina availed itself of, where they basically did a, you know, uh, they say, your domestic currency, our currency, we can swap it, and then you can take our currency and go buy dollars. This will lead to the second point. But at the same time as China's development uh, funding has come on, on the world scene through the Brick Belt and Road Initiative, through the People's Bank of China and so on, there's been a demonization of Chinese funding. And I think this is actually not very good for the world. Um, you know, we know that in Sri Lanka, the situation was not China. China only held 10% of the paper. 45% of the paper was held by companies like BlackRock and so on. Um, 16 IMF agreements that Sri Lanka has held since 1966. You know, uh, it's not a dead trap diplomacy with China around Hambantota port. This had directly to do with um, very poor management by the Sri Lankan elites and these terrible IMF austerity agreements, including in the middle of the crisis that just took place. But yet there's a kind of demonization of China. And I want to caution about that because I don't think it's actually an accurate fact-based demonization. This is a precisely an ideological um, issue. Secondly, I just like to say that, you know, the debate around multipolarity and fragmentation, I think is a little misplaced because we have to look at it at different scales. Um, the world economy is so integrated now that to think of fragmentation um, is actually quite impossible. And any attempt at fragmentation isn't going to really work. Um, you know, uh, Kate talked about um, green technologies. Well, where are they produced? You know, bulk of them are produced in China. So how is the United States going to have a Keynesian-esque Green New Deal without buying um, solar panels from China? Let, let's just face it, you know, lithium, I was in the Atacama salt flat just about 10 days ago in northern Chile, went and saw the massive lithium extraction units um, the lithium doesn't stay in Chile. Chile, in fact, has very poor management of its lithium. It just goes off. It gets processed offshore, um, made into batteries, often in China, and then sold into the kind of Tesla world and so on. Um, you know, Bolivia produces its own batteries. In fact, it's produced an electric car, but, but not Chile. It just lets it leach out. Very poor management of natural resources, in, in my opinion. And by the way, the king of lithium is the son-in-law of August, Augusto Pinochet, just to put that on the table in case you didn't know that. Um, well, so the second point I'm making is, you know, that the world order is very complicated and it's difficult to even imagine, um, let's say an American wall built around Russia and China. It's very difficult. Um, the United States is, will collect, look at the struggles the Germans are facing now over energy. Um, having, I suppose, prematurely said, we're going to cut energy from, from Russia now, you know, Olaf Schulz goes to look and see what um, Nord Stream 1, uh, you know, he went to inspect Nord Stream 1, forget Nord Stream 2. Um, they are stuck in the historic integration of Eurasia. And so this idea of fragmentation is simply not possible, Richard. On the other hand, what is multipolarity? I, I don't actually believe that we'll go in a multipolar direction. We know that the uh, uh, dollar is going to remain as a principal trading currency for a long time because we know it's not easy to switch from one principal trading currency, particularly now. This is not the 1920s and 30s when the world economy was 
differently um, globalized than it is now. It was, you know, there were imperialist forces. There was the kind of imperial preference system that the British had and so on. Now we are in a very different situation where the dollar does play a role. I really think what um, Cecilia said earlier about standard drawing rights is super important. They need to be loosened. We need to open that up to give countries some financing. But here comes the, the, the third point on this. Um, it's not, and I agree with, Kev, with, with Kevin entirely, when there's a quote unquote challenge, um, the world order shifts a little bit. But on the other hand, it's not about the United States. It's not about China. I visit um, the countries of the South often. I was in Zambia. I was surprised to see um, that the, um, the Zambian political elites simply don't have a project for their country. Um, and I would like to say that in most of, of South America, despite the new government coming in, well, today in Colombia, Gustavo Petro, Francia Marquez, what's the project that you have? You see, it's one thing to say you have a choice of financing, but what are you getting the financing for? Is it merely to pay these global surcharges that Kevin has been yelling and screaming about? Or is it to actually build some capacity in your country? What is our project? And I would like to close my sense here with that. You know, it's not just about the IMF is terrible or, you know, be careful of Chinese financing. What are you getting financing for? You know, this used to be on the debate at early UNCTAD meetings. You know, what is our project? Import substitution, thinking about better uh, management of resources and so on. That was the construction of domestic, regional and third world projects. Simply not on the table today, Richard. That's something of great concern. Situation is so bad that when Uganda signed a deal to finance the Entebbe International Airport, the Ministry of Finance didn't even read the deal. After the scandal over that airport, they said, well, sorry, there were lots of problems with the deal, but we didn't get a chance to read it. We have to also think about the capacity in our countries um, to engage. You know that when, when countries come to IMF meetings, you know, when the United States walks in, there's like 20 lawyers. They've printed out all the text. They show up. They've got everything highlighted and so on. When a small country comes to these negotiations, you know, the, there's just no capacity. They don't have the 20, 30 lawyers. They don't even have the capacity to print out all the documents. Um, we really need to put that on the table. It's not just an abstract question. These are questions of capacity. Some of this was raised in the South Commission report in 1990. Boy, um, that was 30 years ago. Uh, I, want, I want to bring in Kate in a way here, because. I mean, part of the original project was also not just a lot of our discussion is framed about interstate relations here. Of course, the original NIEO was also concerned about corporate power and the fact that the, the abuse of corporate power in the South and including in Chile, of course, that was a, a central issue. In many respects, if anyone has a project in the 21st century, it's very large international corporations, Kate. They, they, they don't seem to have a problem in defining their project. Um, I just wonder how, you know, when you're thinking about these challenges around the global Green New Deal um, and the need to contest corporate power in some of the areas that you raised, the whole question of extractive industries that will be key to building greener economies, what, where, and you know, and, and we saw it again in the in the discussions at the WTO multilateral, uh, the ministerial around vaccines. Again, you know, the brazen power of corporations there against uh, public interest. Where, how, you know, for, given that in many respects the United States remains at the centre of that debate, where where do we stand in terms of finding a countervailing power that can contest the influence of, of very large international corporations? Yeah, it's an interesting question, at least in, in the US and the UK, where, you know, I do a lot of my writing. Um, there's a sort of tempting narrative around corporate power and climate, which says, you know, there are these 40 or 50 guys who, you know, wake up every morning and uh, are plotting the end of the world and how to destroy as many, uh, as many places as possible. And, you know, you sort of look at what companies like ExxonMobil and Shell are doing and 
you can find reasons why that's very compelling. Um, but I think, you know, in the climate world and sort of climate advocacy, um, there there is a need to sort of go beyond that and to actually look at, you know, what are these corporations doing? How do they function? Um, and on fossil fuels, you know, it's it's a really sort of interesting question because they do have quite sort of, um, you know, massive uh, networks, right? If, if you're a company like Shell or BP, your operations sort of span the globe. And, you know, the United States is in some cases a relatively small part of the business that you're, that you're doing. And so, you know, in thinking about how to take on corporate power of the, the fossil fuel industry in particular, which is privately held fossil fuel companies, which is what I think about, I think, you know, we have to return to sort of this question of global governance, right? Um, because there is no real mechanism for uh, countries to hold, you know, US-based capital really accountable uh, for crimes and uh, wrongdoing that they commit abroad, right? So there is no sort of inverse of something like the Energy Charter Treaty, which allows corporations to uh, sue sovereign governments if they are found to be infringing on their profits in these secretive tribunals that um, UNCTAD collects really great data on that I've used uh, repeatedly. Uh, and there's just no, you know, sort of, um, there's no inverse of that. There's no way to sort of hold in some legal, uh, legal concrete way uh, those, those companies accountable. And that's, you know, true, I think, in, in, in of corporate power more generally. Um, but I think there are, you know, to not be too much of a bummer, like fairly concrete things we can think about, right? So there have been uh, lawsuits in uh, Dutch courts, for instance, against Shell uh, and their wrongdoing in Nigeria. Um, you know, there's talk sort of every so often about uh, potential uses for uh, the International Criminal Court, which I'm sure folks on this call will have thoughts on uh, the sort of hopes of getting anything done quickly there uh, in terms of holding holding corporations accountable, um, but also, you know, on taxation. Right. And there has been um, a push recently, including, you know, in fairly high level uh, parts of the U.S. government. Uh, Janet Yellen has spoken about this and then, you know, in international institutions to hold uh, companies accountable in that way to not, you know, just be able to offshore their assets and to, um, you know, really sort of um, keep uh, keep their earnings out of out of the hands of, of taxpayers. And it's interesting now, you know, in the in the U.S. And, and U.K. in particular, there is a, more, I think, than any other moment I've seen a real sort of anger at uh, the profits of privately held fossil fuel companies uh, and, you know, these sort of massive earnings they're taking uh, while, you know, in the U.K. there's a mounting cost of living crisis. Um, the U.S. gas prices are are going up, um, although, you know, do remain sort of quite cheap by global standards. Um, and so something I've been thinking through is, you know, what are the, and, and, you know, other folks in sort of movement spaces are doing this as well. What are the opportunities for that? Right. And how is that not just sort of a question of what do these fossil fuel companies owe to people in the U S and UK, but how do we broaden that conversation? Um, because the people, of course, on the losing end of, of these companies historically have not uh, inordinately been in the US and UK, right? They have been in the rest of the world, uh, in the countries where um, they extract resources and have you know, entered into these really onerous sort of concessionary arrangements uh, in the, in the early 20th century um, to steal wealth, essentially. So um, it's, a, it's an interesting moment, I think, for that, uh, for that debate, right? Just because people are so sort of intensely focused focused on um, what are, you know, wrongly taken profits, right? And so what are the ways that that conversation can stretch back a little bit um, historically and sort of be an entree into conversations about um, climate debt, conversations about corporate accountability and about, you know, what, um, you know, some of these companies were state owned at a certain point by the British and, uh, you know, had very high level connections in the American government. So what can, uh, what, what can sort of justice look like in a broader sense and not, 
you know, taking something like windfall tax, for instance, as a starting place, and then expanding a much broader um, debate about that. And yeah, I think it's we're in a, a, a very uncertain, a very you know scary in some senses moment. But I think there are um, opportunities like that to to really start probing um, the you know privately held companies especially and the state-owned companies I think are another another beast um, that you know are probably the discussion of another call <laughs> that I, I won't get get too into uh, yeah thanks because I've of course gone well every time you uh, this is an expansive conversation that can go in many directions and one response of course leads to opens up multiple other avenues to pursue unfortunately we can't do that now as I have to close uh, not only this panel, but also the, the, the summer school itself. But there is one question, kind of, I'm, I'm gonna free ride on you for the closing. But there is one question that I think if, if you could all give a very succinct answer to that was raised by one of the uh, uh, participants about what kind of, what issues young scholars, in light of the conversation that we've had, what are the issues that you would like to see uh, young scholars uh, pursuing in their in their ongoing research efforts. So I will start. I think the opposite. I'll start with you, Cecilia. I'll start the the opposite way I started the conversation. So Cecilia, what what should young scholars really be focusing on now? Thanks a lot, uh, Richard. That that's a very good question. In fact, uh, I I cherish it. Um, and I will say uh, three things. Um, first, I really think that the pandemic and the war and all the instability and uncertainty we're going through uh, have really shaken economic thinking. And a lot of uh, issues and myths have been and are being questioned. You know, the, the idea of the role of the state basically is being rethought significantly. The issue I think is a key priority now is to how to think about the role of the state for the next uh, decades, avoiding the very simplistic binary discussion of like big states, small neoliberal states, right? We need to really think in very innovative ways about what can be the role of the state. And this is because an issue that I wanted to highlight from before, uh, for as much as I'm a big supporter of multilateral cooperation and uh, international discussions, we really need to always be very clear about what, something what Kate mentioned a lot, that is uh, development happens at the local, at the domestic level, and national policies are absolutely fundamental. So we need to get more fiscal uh, room for fiscal maneuver space from the multilateral system, but we also need to make sure that the national policies are well delivered, well designed and well implemented and a state capacity and a state thinking I think absolutely key. So that's one big issue. Sorry, uh, I will mention a second one, Richard, which is the relation between climate and development. Uh, again, uh, a lot of times, uh, climate discussions are very much framed and thought with the North lenses of the discussion. Uh, and we really need to adapt and integrate this climate crisis that we're going through with uh, poverty alleviation, with uh, inequality growth in the South, with uh, industrialization and job creation in the South. Southern economies, developing countries are significantly different in their structure, in their specifics, in their history, in their contribution to the climate crisis. We really need to give a, a lot of uh, original thinking about that. Last comment, I think the World Bank is in fact doing a good work in that area, balancing mitigation policies with uh, resilience and adaptation policies. There's a climate change action plan that pushes for 50% adaptation and 50% mitigation. I think this could even be more ambitious in terms of adaptation because in the global south, in developing countries, uh, we really need to focus on that to preserve uh, climate and also to preserve lives and, and livelihoods. So I think this is really this important areas to, to discuss and, and focus on. Great, Vijay. Yeah, Yes, um, you know, firstly, please um, focus on anything that you're passionate about. Uh, don't pick something because somebody has told you you should study it. Uh, look inside your heart, follow your values. Um, honestly, I've lived my whole career uh, trying my best to 
be honest to myself. And sometimes it gets me into trouble because uh, people say, oh, he's not serious or he's not an objective person or whatever. Um, being serious sometimes is what gets us into a lot of trouble uh, because we don't take utopian thinking seriously enough. So that's the first thing. And related to that, you know, I, I want to say that, um, look, 100 years ago, Gandhi in a speech in Pune said something that has stayed with me. Not, I'm not 100 years old, but when I first read it, it really struck me. Um, he said, a test of civilization of a country is not the number of millionaires it has, but the absence of starvation among its people. Um, well, now you have to change it to billionaires. Um, but I think that formula is absolutely, you know, it's inspirational. Um, your countries, your national projects shouldn't be defined by the amount of wealth there is, even the GDP actually. But whether you can look honestly at your data and say that we have eradicated absolute poverty, in fact, we have eradicated hunger, um, that should be the motivating factor for all governments, for all policies, in my, in my opinion. So I very much hope that you look deeply into your own hearts and find there somewhere the compassion that allows you to acknowledge what Gandhi is saying. It's far more important to abolish hunger than it is to have a high GDP. You may need a high GDP to abolish hunger, but we know that high GDP is not the same as abolishing hunger. We need to look at the economy in a different way. We need to understand unpaid care work, for instance, as a significant part of the creation of civilization. Um, you got to have your values front and center. Great, and then Kate. Um, I would I would echo that and uh, speaking somewhat selfishly as someone whose job involved uh, reporting on quite a lot of academic papers. Um, this is one I would love to report on is um, just, you know, looking at the sort of um, relationship between the carbon budget, right, the sort of finite amount of carbon that can be burned before crossing um, even more sort of catastrophic thresholds and um, the remaining uh, revenues to be taken from oil and gas, right? So I think that uh, the climate finance question and uh, oil revenues get a little bit siloed. Um, those, you know, don't often get talked about together, but who, who is owed those revenues? What is the sort of governance system um, by which they should be distributed? Who makes those decisions? I think that, you know, in thinking about what a new Bretton Woods might look like, what, you know, a new international economic order um, would look like, you know, obviously resource um, resource distribution uh, was very central to the NIEO. And I think um, oil certainly was, you know, a part of that moment in a very big way. And so, in the 21st century, as we think about needing to wind down uh, fossil fuel production rapidly, thinking through um, what are the international dimensions of making sure that all of you know that revenue is not held by Exxon and Chevron uh, exclusively and by you know billionaires in the global north, um, and yeah, having a sort of governance framework to think through, I think would be very exciting. Stranded assets. We we don't do enough work on stranded assets. That's for sure, Kevin. Well, I'll echo what all my friends said. And the only thing I would add for all of you is that you really need to, to see the world uh, you know, as, an, as an academic who teaches a lot of, makes a lot of my students read a lot of stuff. There's no substitute for being embedded, uh, for traveling to some of the most poorest areas of the world, to some of the most richest, richest areas of the world, um, because you need to experience and see and embed yourself. And if, if you have the it's, a, it's much cheaper than it was for my generation to sort of live in other places. I've had an opportunity to do that uh, later in life, but the, to the extent where you can really embed in, uh, in the world, especially in the global south, uh, there's, nothing, there's no substitute for experiential learning. And through that experiential learning, you'll get the kinds of inspirations that VJ talked about. So that's number one. Number two, I think the central question of our time is, touching on what Cecilia and Kate just said, is we need a new economic and political economic model for a transformation to a low carbon and socially inclusive economy. And that the way that, with all due respect, civil society organizations and Northern governments think about climate change is not that. That is a mitigation and adaptation kind of, where can we put nuts and bolts 
uh, on different parts of the of the model that we have in order to meet these climate goals. We have to be fundamentally governed by this carbon budget that uh, that Kate talks about and that scientists tell us about every day, but also with a new set of principles about human dignity, self-actualization, community life, and multilateralism. Let me just end with uh, two two quick quotes, uh, or maybe just one uh, that Richard and I have in our have in our book, uh, where we quote Martin Luther King, a uh, former graduate of Boston University, where I teach who says that we're confronted with the fierce urgency of now. And in this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing of being too late. This is not a time for apathy and complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. Those words ring just as true as they did in 1968 when he was uh, talking about the Vietnam War uh, as uh, then right now when we're talking about the need to reset the global economy for climate and social justice in a development friendly manner. Thanks so much for having me, everyone. Thanks, Kevin. Jamie? Yeah, very, very quickly and relatedly, I would say if you're interested in change and questions of change, don't only study ideas and institutions and kind of possible technocratic fixes to the problems that we face, but also study social movements and how they develop leverage and how they operate on uh, the kind of scales that we're interested here, the scales of nation states and the scales um, of the world. Great, Jamie, thank you. Um, and thank you all for participating in this great, great discussion. It's certainly not uh, an end to the discussion, unfortunately. It's hopefully the beginning of a, of a, a, long, a longer discussion, but an urgent one. Um, and also let me use the, and, and thank you for doing my job in a way of, of, of incentivizing young scholars. I mean, because the whole point of the summer school, of course, is to incentivize young scholars to, to uh, do this kind of work and to challenge the status quo, to challenge conventional economic thinking and to come up with uh, fresh ideas and, and, and fresh ways of looking at both old and, and, and new challenges. And, and, and all the lecturers, I think, this year have, have contributed in, in one way or another uh, to, that, to that discussion. And we very much hope that everybody who participated uh, found, found the lectures uh, useful. Uh, thank you all for participating at that level. I mean, the school only works to the extent that we get um, uh, you participating. And we've had, again, hundreds of people uh, joining for, for each session. And, and, and we're very gratified by the enthusiasm that, that has been shown in, in, in the summer school that this is the fifth uh, uh, of, the, of the schools that we've, that we've been running. So again, thank, thank you all. We look forward to seeing you next year. I should say there's a continuation of this discussion with the YSI um, after uh, this event. You can register for that. There's a, that's a part of the school that the, the YSI organize and I, I would encourage you all to participate. Um, uh, we will be back next year um uh, of, of course we're not quite sure of the format that will take uh, let me again end by finish uh, uh, finish by by um thanking the people who organized that i mean we're doing in a way the easy work there's a lot of people behind the scenes who who we depend on for for putting this together uh, claire and, and heskin and Jared Inet and Ursula maria and gull uh, from the uncle side so let me again thank them uh, for, for the work that they have uh, put in to, to this effort. And let me just wish you all, wherever you are heading, um, I'm heading to watch the start of the English Premier League, which kicks off today um, with my team, Arsenal, uh, doing the honours, not with great confidence, I have to say. Um, but wherever you're going, uh, enjoy, enjoy your rest of the day. And thank you all again for, for participating. It was great. Thank you very much.